Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you here. I'm Jeff Green, teaching the political science department at Penn and also direct the Andre Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy. And one of the initiatives at the center that we've been doing now in our fifth year is this Politics on the Edge lecture series that's done in partnership with the Philomathian Society, also at Penn. And the series has a broad mandate. It looks to discuss contemporary political issues in a convivial yet serious atmosphere. We invite leading figures from diverse fields, journalism, political advocacy, academia, and art to share perspectives that are fresh and novel, whether because of the topics they address, the provocative nature of their arguments, or their simple excellence. And past topics to give you some example of the series have included democracy protests in Hong Kong. We had a leader of the protests um, with us uh, last year, an event on Penn and its relationship to people of color. One of our first was on the history of hijacking in America. And also we recently had um, a professor speak about the rise of new forms of conspiratorial thinking in the world. While we don't have a settled definition of what is politics on the edge, we know it when we see it. And today's topic of cyber conflict clearly qualifies. It's a new and growing dimension of international conflict. It has the potential to be extraordinarily disruptive. At the same time, it can be surreptitious. It can be going on and many of us not even know that it's happening. It's likely to be an ever growing part of the discussion in the study of conflict going forward. And it raises important questions, especially for a democratic society with its values of popular sovereignty, transparency, and so forth. We're really fortunate to have with us today Professor Herbert Lin, a renowned expert in these topics. He is a senior research scholar at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford, where he's also the Hank J. Holland Fellow in Cyber Policy and Security at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And when the students of the Philomathian Society and I consulted about who to invite for this event, Herb was at the very top of the list, the first choice. We're so grateful that he accepted the invitation and has flown across the country to be here with us. Among his many publications is the book just released this month, Cyber Threats and Nuclear Weapons. Congratulations on that. And he's also the author of the 2019 book, Bites, Bombs, and Spies, The Strategic Dimensions of Offensive Cyber Operations. Herb has far-reaching research interests, including not just cybersecurity, but cognitive science, science education, and biophysics. His academic work has overlapped with a variety of high-profile public service appointments, including serving on President Obama's Commission on Enhancing National Cybersecurity, and earlier in his career, serving as a professional staff member and staff scientist for the House Armed Services Committee. I wanna thank our co-sponsors for this event, Perry Worldhouse, the Brown Center for International Politics, and Penn's Department of the History and Sociology of Science. And above all, I wanna thank the Philomathian Society, and especially Cole Lewis for all their work organizing this event. So with that said, I'd like to welcome Herbert Lin. Thank you. Thank you. This is volume here is good. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for um, for, for for having me. Um, uh, and I'm assuming that talking through a mask here is okay, right? You, you, you're okay. Good. Thank you. Um, that was my first question for Jeffrey. He's about to ventilate and, and safety precautions again. So I appreciate that. Um, in the pre-discussion. Uh, someone asked me, but you're back in the business. How did you get to this? Uh, and, and, and the answer uh, to, to, to that is that there's, you know, so just, just you can demonstrate my bona fides uh, on, on, on this. I was a hacker before it was me to be a hacker. Um, in fact, it, it was people like me, not me, but people like me, that they passed the laws, the anti hacking laws, to prevent hacking. Um, so I, I have actually been in the machinery doing it for two years and it kept me on a computer. I'm, I'm running a program that does IT bit by bit by bit. Um, you know, and that was when the computer was you know, three times the size of this desk. Now you only carry around in your pockets a phone that is a million times as powerful as the computer that I was using. Uh, so it, it's, it, it, there, there's a long history of, 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 of hacking in, in my background. Um, before it was illegal, so we can't report it. And the statute of limitations is, is, is gone by now. Um, but the technology is completely different, but the mindset is the same. And that, that's what gives me, uh, and, and to the extent that I have any edge at all, that's where I have, some, you know, I have something to, to say. Now, uh -huh, here's, the, here's the keyboard. 
So the, the other thing to just to, to, to note here is that you know when I was coming into the, 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 the room, um, listening, you know, when Jeff had made the comment that oh that, that's why I wish all the technology uh, in every room was as simple as it was here. So I believe that all of you have had the experience of waiting patiently, or maybe not so patiently at the beginning of the talk, waiting for a person to get the slide right. Right? Every one of you has had that experience. Okay. Every one of you has had the experience of the Zoom call not quite working properly. You have to reboot the system. And every one of you has had the experience of calling the help desk. And then what they tell you is, well, I'm not sure what the problem is. Well, why don't we try this? And if that doesn't work, we'll try that. And if that doesn't work, we'll try this other thing. Right? You all have that experience, right? All of you have had that experience. So you know what you realize from that is that what you is that the dying the, the person at the other end of the help desk is not, I mean, I don't know why those aren't are positive to me. Those are not statements of knowledge, those are statements of hope and prayer, right? That something will work eventually. And this is the technology that we are trusting our lives and our national security to. Okay? Because we don't have inside dolls for Defense Department that helps. That, that, that may be the most important thing to, to, to take away from this. With that, let me talk a little bit about this. Okay? And I'm here to talk about a little bit more different about conflict on, 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 on the edge. Um, and, and you may remember that there are two different views of war. Uh, there's a, a Clausewitzian view of war. Right? Um, uh, German theorist of war uh, in the late 1800s. The, the way to fight a war is to destroy the enemy's base for resistance. That is the, the, the armed forces of the enemy. By contrast, there's another view of it, which is origin in the, the Chinese uh, theories of war from Sun Tzu in which the supreme art uh, of war is winning without fighting. So as we go through this, uh, I ask that you keep those two different views in mind and, and, and think about how what I'm about to say sort of plays on, on each of them. The, the US view, most of the Western world view, is informed by the first, the Clausewitzian view. Um, I wouldn't say that the Chinese view is mostly, is mostly Sun Tzu, but there are certainly elements of that in Chinese behavior and, um, and actions. And we, you know, we need to do a lot to um, give a lot to, we should do a lot to understand that, that point of view better. Okay. When we talk about cyberspace, what are some of the risks that, that come out of it? So here, here, are, here are some things, okay? You know, when you when you hack into a computer, um, if you're not doing it just for the fun of it, which is what I was doing, um, it can result in the loss of compromises on basically three attributes: you know, confidentiality, information, integrity of information, and availability of information. So, confidentiality is when I break into your computer and I steal your uh, credit card number your bank account numbers, your letters that, to your lover that you don't want anybody else to know about, so those kinds of things. Integrity, a compromise to integrity, is when I rewrite some of the data so that, you know, you, or destroy some of the data. The very first day I was at Stanford University to, you know, as, as a visitor, um, I spent six hours with a graduate student who had just lost her thesis because of a crash in a hard disk. And she had not backed it up. And I spent six hours with her trying to recover that file. I eventually, we were eventually successful. And she's always been grateful to me for it after that. And believe me, she does back up to now. Um, there's a lesson in, 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 in that. Um, but if I had been a hacker and deleted the thesis, 
stop you know diseases files that would have been an attack on the integrity of data or i could penetrate your electronic medical record and instead of viewing your blood type i could change your blood type and that would probably be worse for you if i change your blood type than if i just looked at it uh, so that's another thing and, and you know, availability is when you can't get at the computer you can't get at the information that you want that little icon spins and spins and spins and spins and spins. And spins and, you know, you know the joke. Right? You can't get at the machine when you can get it. Okay, and hacking can result in any all of these kinds of problems. And that's what the hacker does. On the virtually everything bad that the hacker can do is a result of compromising our computers or complicit information. What could be the impact? Well, there's large-scale societal impact. You can imagine operations against government services, financial services, transportation, education, electrical grid, all sorts of things. We are, of course, in a building right now. These lights are controlled by computer. And the power grids are controlled by computer. Your computer, your transcripts are controlled by computer. They, you, they might exist in a document that the registrar mails you? Maybe. But they really exist in a computer. Okay. Um, your money exists in a computer. Right? It's most, your money is mostly bits. Almost all of your money is mostly bits, except the cash that you have in your pocket and at home. Your money is all in bits. Nothing tangible about it. Okay. Um, your medical records mostly exist in bits. And I increasingly, increasingly so in the future. It's rare that you develop films anymore for an x ray, right? It's all digital. So if you want to think about an attack that you could use to launch on society as a, as a weapon to try to cause large-scale disruption, you can imagine compromising institutions and services um, and disrupt them on a very large scale. A cyber attack on a bank, no, not just a bank, but a whole lot of banks. Or given how closely coupled it is, a cyber attack on one bank that leads to a failure leads to a failure in another bank that leads to a failure in three banks and so on. And see it cascade that way. So that's another way to do it, to deal, to deal with it. You know, a power shutdown here in one part of the grid, and because it's connected to other parts of the grid, that causes a cascading shutdown elsewhere. Large scale disruption. There's another kind of disruption that you could imagine happening, which involves attacks on public confidence. So what you do is you do a small scale disruption and then you advertise it and then you say, I can do this again. So there are a couple of people in here who remember 9-11 for real, who remember you remember the towels coming down and so on. Um, you may remember that two months later, there was an airline crash. Um, what else do you remember that two months later, an airline crash going down in Boston? Some, some place that was in, in the New York metropolitan area down to uh, South America. And the default assumption at that point going into it was that it was an Al Qaeda plot. And it took a lot of work at the time because people were very scared to determine that it was not. So the, the idea that a small scale event could shake public confidence could be. You know, that, that, that has big implications because it means that the kind of attack that you need to launch is technically small. 
you don't have to do very much. You don't have to bring down a whole nation. You just have to bring down a small piece of it and then take credit for it and then brag. And you may have, you know, you, you can imagine somebody doing that to election systems, for example. Okay? Imagine a credible, one credible example of a documented hack of a voting machine. There haven't been any, but imagine one credible attempt, one credible documented, documented example. And then you just make the assertion that this happened in every country. And now the brand focus on all those other election officials show that something else, some, something like that did not happen, right? How do you, and how do you prove that something did not happen? Very hard, as you know. Because, of course, if you can't find it, something happened, maybe the adversary was really clever and was able to hide it. We just don't know. So attacking public confidence is another way to, to go after uh, to go after a nation on a large scale. Okay, and then there's this last thing about mind hacking. Okay, mind hacking in cyberspace or through cyberspace, which is that most people are on electronic media from which they get information about the world around them, what's going on in the world around them. And these people are can have their minds hacked. I can have my mind hacked, you can have your mind hacked, because the thinking processes that we bring to bear in, the, in today's information environment are basically the same thinking processes that people have been using for the last few thousand years. That is, human evolution has not taken us very far in our ability to be sophisticated in our thought. Whereas the volume of information and the speed with which information arrives has gone up by many orders of magnitude. Okay. So we're faced in a, with the situation in which it's very hard to establish a shared fact base with other people. We lose our ability to do rational thought as a society. And the result is that anger and rage and fantasy become the basis for decision making. And we see that increasingly around the world. Okay. And I'm going to go into all of these things in, 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 in this talk. So that's sort of an, an, an outline. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, cyber attacks on important computers. What one way to think about cyber attacks? By the way, I'll make these slides available to anybody. So I can, you, you have uh, available in, the, so Jeff Mark has them, you can, you can do what you want with them. Um, today, security advantage uh, is all about data um, for everybody, domestic regimes, foreign and foreign relations, and for companies and, and so on. There are, you might say, say four main state adversaries, the canonical four bad guys. Uh, and four flavors of threat or attack. They steal stuff, they disrupt stuff, they destroy stuff, and they deceive. Okay. This is a very new world. Okay. There are different fundamentals in play. And it's not just a new vector for harm. It's not just one more. It's a very new world okay, where it's governed by, the, it, it, it's a world governed by the laws of bits, not the laws of atoms, not the laws of physics. It's bits that matter. I mean, I, I, I see, you know, you're all, you're all here. You're, you're, you're. Normally, in the last year and a half, I'd be seeing on a screen, right? That's a very different world. Okay. In this world, power and distance, or at least traditional power, don't protect, right? I could go, you know, I, I used to go to one seminar a week because well, physically, and it was on the Stanford campus. And now I can go to three seminars a week, and they're all over the damn world. Right? I just have to be willing to get up in time. Okay. The strengths are the same as our vulnerabilities. It's not like in the physical world where you have offsetting strengths and vulnerabilities. 
you make a tank heavier, you give it more armor, you make it more protected, you give it more protection, but it becomes slower. Just a different attribute. Here, the difference is that the, our strengths become our vulnerability. So for example, connectivity. Connectivity to the rest of the world is, a, is essentially infinite now. You can, you're connected to almost everybody. It's just a question of the delay time. Okay. But to first order, every computer in the world is connected to every other computer. It just takes how long it takes you to get there. That's what's at issue. But in exactly that connectivity that enables all the bad guys to get to you too. So now not only are you connected to everybody in the world, but everybody in the, every bad guy in the world is connected to you. Because of strength, because of the higher connectivity that we have to good guys. And it's a vulnerability because of the higher connectivity to bad guys. Free speech. Free speech is a wonderful thing. But weaponized free speech, where you use exactly the same tools of free speech and, and you invoke exactly the same rights to spread disinformation, that's a bad thing. So free speech protects good speech and it also protects bad speech. Okay? So the strength that we have in free speech, and I guarantee you, it's a vulnerability too. We're always under cyber attack. Deterrence doesn't work in the way in which we, we usually understand it. Okay. There are at least five or six or seven computers sitting out there right now. And hopefully, hopefully most of you are not on Facebook, but you know, that's okay. Even if you are, it's fine. You're still being attacked. If you're an online guy, you're being attacked. It's just that you have various protections against attack that are keeping them away from you. But you're all under attack right now. Conflict doesn't really look like war. Okay. We're in an environment in which a whole bunch of small attacks can add up to have a big cumulative effect. You know, I steal a nickel from you a day, add it up over a you know, lifetime. Well, that's not a lot, but you know, it's the, the, the kind of thing where you steal a little bit, a little bit more, and a little bit more over time, it adds up. That is the entire argument, by the way, about why cyber enabled espionage by China or whoever is supposed to be bad. No one incident is really bad, but taken as a whole over an, over an extended period of time, they have mountains of data that they didn't have before. And here you have an environment in which the private sector is the target of state actors. North Korea attacks Sony. Sony, a corporation. It went out of its way to attack a corporation, not Japan, not the United States, but Sony. That's not the world that international lawyers usually live in. It's not the sort of structure, it's not the sort of arrangement that the UN Charter was designed to prevent to deal with. What is going to be criticized if anything exists at all? Okay. I know how to build a completely secure computer. It's all on the back. Okay. You won't recognize this. Okay. There's a computer and we put it inside a sealed metal box. Nothing can get in, nothing can get out. Perfectly secure. All of you will admit that. But nobody's going to pay, you know, 500 bucks for that. Okay. It's useless. Why? because nothing can get in, nothing can get out. To make it useful, you have to take away the box. You have to let information in so that you can get information out. Ah, the trick is what information you let in. Is it good information? Is it good data? Is it bad data? Is it a good program that you're letting in? Is it a bad program that you're letting in? That's what makes it useful if it's good. It's not useful to you if it's bad. But of course, that means somebody has to decide whether something is good or bad. Right? Whether a piece of information in is good or bad. And if you're not sure, which way do you go? Well, you don't know. Okay? 
How many times have you come up with a decision, the computer, you, you click on something and it says, are you sure you want to do this? Right? And the answer is, of course, yes. Who the hell understands why the, what it's asking you for? It says, do you really want to delete this file? Of course I want to delete this file. Okay, but then I have to wait a minute. Really is right now I wanted to, I just press the delete key. Right? If it asked me that in 10 minutes, that would be different. I might answer might be different in 10 minutes. Wait a minute, I shouldn't have deleted that file. But if it's just right next to me, how can I how can I make that decision? And so there's a, there's a problem there. So you have to make those decisions about what's you know the right thing in the long term. You have to make those decisions first. And a computer can't make those decisions for you because you won't even doing the course job. We talked about this about the bad guy, what a bad guy can compromise. There's a broad range of bad guys. Okay, the lone hacker seeking fame and glory. In fact, when I was a hacker, that's what we hacked for glory. Right? You've got bragging rights. You got bragging rights. You got you got to be able to say, "I broke into such and such a system," and that gave you a lot of credit. Okay. Yeah, sometimes computers, some criminals act on their own for for profit. There are organized crime units that act for you know for for profit, drug cartels. There are perhaps international terrorists, state sponsored, the small nation states, large nation states. There's a broad range of bad guys. And the thing that mostly that confounds this all is the fact that you can now hire out services. You can buy hacking services on the net, probably with a stolen credit card. Okay. You can buy hacking services, which means that all I need is the desire to hack. I don't need to have any of the skills. I can just pay somebody to do it for me. So that breaks the coupling between needing to know anything and wanting and wanting a certain outcome. So over time, what's happened is that yes, our secure cybersecurity has gotten better. That's the lower blue line. We've gotten better at doing cybersecurity. So we are, this is 2021, we are great. At dealing with the cybersecurity threat of, 20, of, of, of 2010. We're doing great against that. But of course, the threat is evolved. And we're not dealing just with the threat of 2010 today. We're also dealing with the threat of 2020, 2021 today. Okay. And that threat has gone up. Okay. And it's gone up also, it's gone up even faster. And so, a good way to think about this is that this, this gap, which is growing in time, has two parts. A part one gap is the fact that a lot of us here do stupid things, including me, like use the same password on multiple accounts and stuff like that. It's a dumb thing to do. Do as I say, but not as I do, right? Don't use the same password on, on different accounts. But of course, we do it because it's convenient. You do this. But you know, if you stop doing this, you all get better. So the fact that there are people like me who are dumb about our cybersecurity practices, if we could get you know, me to do good cybersecurity practices, all the time we'd get a lot better. So that's the part we get. But even if everybody did that, there's still, that's still not enough. And so there's a, another gap that's sort of where we don't know what to do. The fact that we, I can say to you, I do dumb things, and I know they're dumb, but I do them anyway. What that means is that we know how to fix that problem, at least technically. But we don't know how to fix the, the you know, the, the, the part two problem. That's why, that, that's why, you know, graduate students are computer scientists. Okay. Why can't we get ahead of this game? Why is this gap growing? Here's a proposition for you. Innovation, which all of us think is a wonderful thing, means, what by definition it means you can do more. It's increased functionality. That is, our appetite for computers doing more is unlimited. We always want our computer systems to do more. 
be faster, be easier to use, give you more functionality, to work on a wider range of data, be backwards compatible. We always want to do more. More functionality means more complex design and implementation. And any security person will tell you the complexity is the enemy of security. Something that's bigger and more complex means there are more ways that things can go wrong. And the bigger the system, the harder it is to predict what it's going to do, or even understand what it's going to do. And poorly understood interactions are the primary points of vulnerability. That is, the attacker can bang on you until he finds a point of vulnerability. And so it is my claim that since things will be increasingly insecure, if you can't figure out a way to moderate the attack type, to say, no, I don't need all those new functions. I'll give you an example. I am right now trying to buy a new refrigerator. I do not want one with internet connectivity. I don't want a refrigerator that has Wi-Fi capability. As it turns out, there are some refrigerators without Wi-Fi capability. But I guarantee you that in 10 years, they're not going to be impossible to get. You can buy a toothbrush right now with Bluetooth capability. Think about this. A toothbrush with that's connected to the internet. Gives you all these new features of sending like brushing records to my dentist or something. Okay. So why? I think there's an interesting question there. We don't some things we don't need. There are some organizational issues too. Most of the internet, mo most of the information infrastructure is owned by the private sector. Eighty-five percent of it is owned by the private sector. Government can't do it by itself. And there's no, there's no one party that's responsible for any of this stuff. The agencies with the best capabilities to defend are not trusted. National Security Agency, they're not trusted. And the ones that have the role and mission and who are more trusted, they don't have the best capabilities. Department of Homeland Security? Okay, but mostly people think the Department of Homeland Security is incompetent. So they're either untrustworthy or they're incompetent. That's not a great choice. Now, in fact, they both have, I mean, th that's not a fair rap, both of them, okay? NSA, I think, actually is pretty trustworthy. And I think that the DHS on the side is actually pretty good. But these are widespread perceptions. And the last point is that cybersecurity is always a cost center. It never helps you to invest in cybersecurity. It never gives you anything to do. It always takes away from your ability to do something faster, better, cheaper. The fundamental reality of cyber threats is that the offense is dominant in most situations. Given enough time, the offense is always going to be successful. And in the long run, the only way to thwart offense is to not provide offense. Opportunity, provide opportunities for offense to work. Talk about attacks on critical infrastructure is what people often think about when they think about cyber risk to the nation. These are the 16 critical infrastructure sectors. You can sum it up emergency services, food and agriculture, energy, uh, financial, etc. Okay. By the way, these sectors account for like 80%, 70% of the US economy. So everything is critical. It's not going to be just an observation in there and spent by itself. I don't expect you to, to, to go through this chart, except to note that there are interconnections between each of the critical infrastructures. So on the left, you see that electricity is common to everybody. Everybody depends on electricity, and also everybody depends on telephones. And so if you disrupt electricity or telecoms, those are the two places where you get the highest leverage, you can affect everything. And of course, there are all kinds of interactions in between 
the, the various guys, the various sectors there too. What are some of the things that you can do when you want if you want to attack a, uh, a critical infrastructure? These are those are what you could do on a chemical plant. Okay. Chemical plant has the interesting characteristic that it's operated, you know, you, the valves and so on are operated by computer. But the operation of the plant, what actually happens on a day to day, you know, on an hour to hour basis, is governed by physics. This is what happens when you arrange things in such a way that the pressure inside of a big pipe drops below zero. It crushes because the atmosphere crunches it. Here is an image of an interesting test. This is an electric generator. That's a generator. It's chunking away, and there is a shutter there. And there's a cyber attack going on it on it right now. Chunking again. It's still trying to generate electricity. You can see the smoke starting to come out of it. You can see more smoke coming out of it. I guarantee you that's an unhappy generator. This is a remote viewer. So that was a real experiment done in 2007. And it was an eye opener to, it was not an eye opener to anybody who had, sorry, who had computer experience, because they knew that was possible. But as real life opener to policymakers who actually could see that a cyber attack could destroy a physical piece of infrastructure. You can imagine different kinds of attacks, or this is sort of a way of summarizing some of what I said. Attacks on operational technology, those are the attacks on the physical infrastructure, the electric grid and the like. Surrounding that are the, is the corporate information technology, it does the billing and stuff like that. And then there's the, and, and the stuff that faces the rest of society, going to the outside of, of, of society. Uh, there's, the, there's the impact on society from a perception point of view. And we talked about this uh, earlier about small attacks with a big impact on public confidence. Financial institution, one bank, electoral infrastructure, we talked about that. We didn't talk about documented air crashes. So imagine if you were able to take down one airplane with a cyber attack and then claim credit for it and then show you could take care that you could take on another airplane. We saw some of this with the 737 MAX. Okay. You may remember that the first time it crashed, there was, eh, it could have been pilot error, we weren't sure what happened and so on. There was a lot of hesitation about what steps to take. After the second one crashed, instantly the whole, the whole fleet was grounded. Instantly. You can imagine that kind of scenario happening again with the, uh, um, with a, a, a broader scale, um, you know, this kind of cyber attack on, on, on the air traffic control system or on your lives. Reduce public confidence in, for anybody applying for anything. Talk a little bit about the impact of technology, of information technology on the nuclear enterprise. This is the subject of the book that Jeff was so nice to, to, to mention. We often talk about we have a large arsenal of nuclear weapons. You have to build the nuclear weapons. 
We have to maintain them. They're no longer building on them. We have to maintain them now. We have to put them onto delivery systems that take them from here to there, the target. We have ordered them into attachment. We have ordered them into, uh, in, into use as a command and control system. We have to be warned of an attack coming in on us. That's the early warning function. We have to plan how we're using all of these information records. Uh, and we have to decide whether or not to use nuclear weapons. So there are all kinds of interesting places where information technology is used. Um, and the point is that it's all dependent on information technology and all be screwed up by somebody hacking. Now, are there measures in place to prevent hacking? Of course. And some of those measures are pretty good. But they're not perfect. And they are points of vulnerability. And there is often a lack of attention at the bottom, despite what the people at the top say. So you will find senior defense department people say, absolutely, cyber risk is something we have to take very seriously, we have to fix the problem. And you still go to a critical facility and there's a, a, a door that says, do not prop this door open, that's propped open with a brick. So the actual reality on the ground is often very different than what the top people say. I'll give you some examples here, just, to, sorry, just to give you some examples of how all this stuff might interfere with um, uh, decision-making um, uh, in, in a crisis. So for example, uh, Let's say that, just for example, the, 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 there's a crisis going on. And you know, just to take two countries, let's say China and the United States, with apologies to Theo and Tim. Well, imagine a scenario in, in which we have, uh, the Chinese are trying to And, and, and uh, we want to find out where they're, they're planning to attack. So we penetrate their command and control systems. We get some real information about it. But if they see us doing that, they may be just worried that we're really looking at them for, to, in preparation for an attack. So we say, no, no, we're doing what we're doing is good. It's not, it shouldn't threaten you because we're, we're just looking around. They say, how do we know that? You can imagine a scenario in which Oh, I don't know, a president might be looking at his Twitter feed. Right? And, and, and there might be interesting information coming across the on Twitter feed. Undead information about what's happening in another country. Right? Is that really the kind of information that would inform the president about the decision to, to, to go to war? Um, there might be you might do a cyber attack against some systems used for conventional war that the other guy thinks are affecting his ability to command to, to affect you know, to, to command his nuclear forces. So that's confusion. So all kinds of ways in which cyber technology uh, can, can corrupt uh, or influence decision making that you don't want. They all We have this principle with nuclear weapons that you never want to use nuclear weapons without proper orders. On the other hand, you always want to use them given proper orders. And you can imagine cyber compromise on one of those sides of the equation. Cyber attack may enable or contribute to the improper issuance of a valid order, or it may interfere with a properly uh, authorized uh, law for war termination order. Both of those scenarios are dangerous. And then the last thing I want to talk about in this section here is AI inserted into drones. This is fictional, completely fictional.
fictional, completely fictional, I promise. Really, it's really fictional, okay? But every piece of technology that was described in there can be seized and is available now and awaits somebody to do exactly this. Okay. It's possible. Okay. That's amazing. So when I distribute the slides, you get the slides. Okay. There's a section on it from you know, 340 to 640 that I said is really upsetting. And I, you know, what I saw here was you know, upsetting enough. But the, the three, three that it's really upsetting. Okay, if you haven't seen it before, um, it depicts what would happen if these were released on a college campus. Okay, so it, you know, it's a, a caution. You know, go go view it at your. I don't want to say safety of your home, but you know, you sleep on one. That's what kind of the creepy statement. That's right, but it was it wasn't just precision. It, it wasn't just facial recognition zooming in on the person. Uh, yes, there, there there have been drone assassination attempts, but at a much larger you know sort of at a much larger scale. It wasn't an individual affected. Um, so something like that happens at the moment hasn't been connected. I want to talk a little bit here about uh, mind hacking. The difference between cyber war and cyber initial mind hacking. Cyber war goes after information technology. Mind hacking goes after your minds. In cyber hacking, in computer hacking, you go after the vulnerabilities in information technology. In cyber enabled mind hacking, you take advantage of the features of information technology to go after people's minds. That is, when the Russians use Facebook to hack minds in the 2016 election, they use Facebook exactly as they use their minds. Exactly. They do not have any. What happened uh, in 2016? The Russians did an overt stuff, did overt stuff and covert stuff. The covert stuff was traditional cyber hacking. Um, the overt stuff was internet research agency and Facebook, Twitter bots, YouTube videos, targeting. Cambridge Analytica and so on. Okay, all those open, not computer hacking in the actual sense. Of the term. Okay. 2020, we have no indication that foreign actors attempted to alter any technical aspect of the, the, the election. That is not not cyber hacking. But we they conducted a wide range of influence operations aimed at denigrating Biden's candidacy. Right, over. Psychological aspects of mind hacking. Why does it work? People have two ways of thinking about the world. There's the intuitive and heuristic way of thinking, and there's the deliberate and analytic way of thinking. This will, if you've read Danny Kahneman's book on, on uh, thinking fast and slow, this is system one on the left, system two on the right. Intuitive heuristic means sort of from the gut, it's fast, it's emotional, it's unconscious. On the right, it's reasoned, it's explicit, it's rule-based, it's logic-based. And heuristics are the vulnerabilities in human processes. That is, heuristics operate very well most of the time, but they don't always operate perfectly. And people make mistakes using them. They take make mistakes more often. For example, fluency, that is something, if something is easier to understand, the more likely to believe it's true. Why should that be the case? And confirmation bias, you only look for stuff that agrees with you, that agrees with your preconceived notions. Illusory truth, that is what you, you believe all when you hear it more. Belief perseverance, that means that when you, you hear something and then you make a judgment based on it, and then you find out that what you believe, what, what's you, Based on it wasn't true, you still believe what you concluded. Group identity is where you, you associate yourself and you internalize the beliefs of a group because it's the beliefs of your group, not because you really believe it. 
And it's about what is really believed in in that context. And so you start to believe things because your group believes them. You've all seen this illusion, right? Which line is mine? You all know the answer. Okay. They're the same. But just looking at math, it still looks as though the top line is mine. Sounds fine. And you have to always either remember it or actually measure it. And that's the difference between system one and system two. System one says those are the same. System two says stop, measure. And you jump to the first. And you have to override that judgment by going to the second and, and going to the second. And then you just start thinking about the technological aspects of mind hacking. It's the internet. It's always on cell phones. It's customized search engines. It's social media. It's the fact that you can get information now from sources without going through any kind of middle person. No middle, no intermediaries, which is both good and bad. You can produce content really cheaply and consume it really cheaply. And you can get video and audio, which is much more emotionally evocative. And what do you get out of this? You get Twitter. Messages about the world in 280 characters. And you can, now you're on the internet, you can find support for whatever you want to believe, no matter how nutty. You get support for that. You can get the same message from apparently different sources, and so you're more likely to believe it. You can customize information, be targeted at you. You get one source of one kind of information. You get a different kind of information, different content, tailored to your specific vulnerabilities, your specific prejudices, your specific inclinations. Okay. And I never have to tell you what I told them. And search engines, they're not optimized for truth. They're optimized for popularity. Right? The answers that you back, get back are answers that you get back because other people think they're useful, not because they're true. And the future, imagine deep fakes, fake video and audio. Um, remember, we now have GPT-3, which is text generation program that is getting to be pretty good. Okay, you get forged emails instead of just leaked emails. That's gonna be to mislead. You have all the stolen data from Equifax and all sorts of other information facts to build customized information profiles in all of you to get lots of demographic variables to understand you very, very well and to target messages specifically aimed at your prejudices. Conversational chatbots that fool you into thinking that they're real. Turns out that Turing test is not all that powerful a test. Lots of people think that they're talking to real things when they're not. Um, Facebook has done experiments on targeting people at times of emotional vulnerability to identify, to identify those moments when they'll be ripe to some sort of intervention. Some of you may have seen this before.
So, a couple of observations here. This is done in 2017. That was four years ago. I guarantee you the technology has gotten better. It's easier to do now, much easier to do now. I'll tell you the most scary thing about this film. It's a personal anecdote. I've now shown this film 50 times to various audiences. And I'm starting to believe that Obama actually said it. Mm -hmm. right? I know that he didn't. I know in some sense in my heart that he didn't. But it's entirely plausible. I can imagine Obama saying those things. And it resonates with my own personal prejudices. And pre, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, preconceived notions that, yeah, I can believe it. And if you wake me up in the middle of the night and shake me, and, you know, did, did Obama really say this? And I'm really feeling asleep. I might well say yes. And that's just the power of repetition. That's totally terrifying to even that. Okay, so, so why can't we get ahead of the mind cybernetic hacking threat? Well, first of all, what is the threat, right? Is it lies, is it misleading claims? Is it hate, is it organizing, whatever you don't like, disagree with? There's an old saying that it's the, it's the best way to lie is to tell the truth. I can feel it, figure out many ways of lying by telling the truth. Where does it come from? Is it, does it matter whether it comes from a foreign source or a domestic source? I sure, it sure matters from the standpoint of law, where all of our law, U.S. law, is oriented towards protecting U.S. citizens. The rights of U.S. citizens. But what happens when those U.S. citizens are doing the bidding of foreigners? Perhaps by inadvertence. What do I do about that? Who should do what? Who should deal with it? Government? Do you really want government being able to decide what's available? They should be individuals? Or do you think that individuals are too stupid to know? Well, of course, the answer to that is yes. And, you know, uh, uh, you're stupid if you don't agree with me. Right? So, of course, I want people to get information that I agree with. The trouble is, you want that too, and we may not agree on, what, on that information. Right? Just be the platform companies, they have no incentives at all to do any of this. Because their business models are oriented towards promoting engagement. And promoting engagement that they have shown is best when you have inflammatory, outrageous, untruthful content. Regardless of political persuasion. So, here are some questions that I just posed for you. I think I've gone about an hour or so. We have, and we have a total of two hours here. And I would love to engage in a, in a discussion. Of, of all of this stuff. You know, here's some questions for you, which I hope that this talk has, has, has motivated. What compromises of liberal democratic freedoms are we willing to endure to fight cybernetic mind control? Are there any? What shouldn't we computerize and why? When will the security costs of information? exceed the benefits of, in, of efficiency and enablement. Right? We go to computers because we think they'll give us better features and you know, we'll make more money that way in the end. But there's a cost to it of more and more computer overhead. When will you know it's not? How will you know? Right? How much government involvement is tolerable in protecting us from cyber? So here, let me give you some, you know, some, some senses. 
The NSA is responsible for defending the nation against cyber attack. That's in its charter. Pointed out earlier that the private sector owns 85% of technology and infrastructure that needs to be protected. And NSA to do a good job of protecting the United States against foreign cyber attack needs to know what's going on inside all of the US infrastructure, including that which is owned by the private sector. If you give it that mission, it has to know what's going on in the things that it's going to demand. That's not an unreasonable proposition. But just what all of you wanted, NSA, all of the private sector, you know, its networks hunting for foreign adversaries in private domestic networks, just what you always want. That's the dilemma that the United States faces. That's what Cyber Command faces. And that's what NSA faces. You, need, you want the intelligence agency to give you information on this threat? You have to let it look. And what if it's looking in your backyard on your computer? How much is involved in technology? And what counts as serious damage? Okay. We're supposed to be protected from serious damage by the government. I mean, that we want the government to protect us from Missiles coming over. What counts as serious damage in cyberspace? So that's the end of my prepared remarks. And I would love to entertain some discussion and uh, question, uh, you know, discuss, discussion about this. So have at it. Yeah, microphones going around. Is it is it on? Right. Where's the on switch? Yeah. There we okay, go. Okay. Great. Um, unfortunately, not too complex. Okay. Uh, I just first of all wanted to say thank you so much for um, this talk. Uh, now we're going to have um, some questions until about five. Um, and so that being said, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> My question was, you know, over the past year and a half, most of the world has become more accepting of technology, right? We were on Zoom for school. Um, we had to use different technologies to work and keep relationships. And I want to know from your, from your point of view, how has that affected, do you think, society's comfort with adopting technology and letting our guard down from attacks like this? Because beforehand, we could be considered more weary of technology. We would prefer to meet in person and things of that nature. However, now we're really very close to technology. Do you think anything has changed in that regard and that we will see more attacks because of our complacency? Thanks. Well, it's always a safe bet to say that things are gonna get worse, right? I mean, that's the way to go. That's the way to be an expert in it. You know, you go to any party and somebody, Ask you what's the future of cyberspace, and they say it's going to get worse, and you'll be right. Okay. So there, there's, um, yeah, and if you want to get you know fancy about it, you use the word attack surface, and you say the attack surface is growing because there's more and more computerization, and, and, and you know nobody knows what attack surface means, and so attack surface is just the number of places that the bad guy can get at you. Um, you just say that, and, and, and you'll be of course correct. So I don't see, I personally don't see um, uh, the, the pandemic induced use of technology as being a, a driver of this in the long run. In the short run, sure. Um, but you know, I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm really desperate to get off of Zoom. I really don't want to use Zoom if I can possibly help it. Um, I offered to, to, to the chat. That I could do this talk by Zoom, but now that's not going to be trouble because things are right. I couldn't have this kind of discussion. You know, you know I, I lecture a class of 175 students. Okay? In fact, about 40 show up um, because I record them and they can see them you know, later on. 
but I can't see their faces. I can't say, oh, you know, this person laughed at my joke, or this person, you know, looks confused or, 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 or something like that. I can't, I can't do that. And I sure can't get into the discussion that I had with somebody in the bathroom about, hey, you know, you look familiar. Oh, yeah, I remember you. you know, and, and, and so on. And I asked just a comment earlier today, you know, and, and so on. I can't get into that kind of conversation. I'm desperate to get off of Zoom. Um, I think most people are. But I think, the, you know, for me, the inevitable trajectory is that people are going to do more and more with technology. I mean, and I, I would prefer, there, there's a saying that I try to impart to my, my technology classes. There are three roads to ruin. Sex is the most fun. Alcohol is the fastest. Technology is the most certain. And because technology promises a lot, and it screws up when you most want it, right? if you don't, unless you arrange things very, very carefully. Right? I have I've consulted with the Department of Defense Cyber Policy Office several times during pandemic. The Cyber Policy Office. They're the guys that are in charge of overseeing Department of Defense cyber operations. I not only have to, I have to make an appointment two days in advance to test the link. And then even then, it works about 50% of the time. I mean, this is nuts, right? Um, and yet, this is this is what we're relying on. So, I I wish that people would have a more skeptical view of technology. I'm afraid it's probably an uphill battle in that. Other business that you, you used to. Yeah. So you talked a lot about the uh, future. You said that basically maybe we should give up on adding features to things in the future. Um, the thing that you didn't talk about was the development of new security protocols and things like that. So for instance, formal verification, use of cryptographic security, things like that. What are your thoughts on using tools and techniques like that to secure systems were previously default? I mean, I, right Sure, the, 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 right. The, the, you know, the point that's being made here uh, for the non-techies here is that there are techniques that are available, tell me if I get this wrong, to apply techniques of formal proof to show that a program is correct and to use cryptographically secure uh, techniques uh, to give you assurance that the person who said, who, who asserts that he did something is in fact that person and, and so on, an authentication issue, so that you know how a real firm works. Okay, so it, it, it's, it's not that you just rely on Jeff to tell you how a firm works, but I can, you know, I can demonstrate in some tangible way, some verifiable way that I did. Right? And so the, the, is that I mean, that's the essence of that's the essence of right. And, so, right. and and how right and there are you know the point that, that, that our friend here is, is our CS graduate student is, is making is that um, these are techniques that are uh, useful for improving security and he's right there's no question about that there's no question about that that he's correct and that there are advances to be made that are really important really powerful to to improve security in systems but you will be the first to acknowledge that a proof of program correctness, a proof that the program is correct, only tells you that the program meets its specifications. Right? Otherwise, how does it know what it means to be correct? There has to be a statement of these are the things the program is supposed to do. Right? That's what it means to say, I can prove that this program works. And how do you know that those program specifications are correct? The answers you don't. I mean, it's by construction, right? That's I mean, well, it, right. It I mean, does you, what it does. That's well, that's right. And maybe what it does is the wrong thing. Okay. The other thing about it is that. Well, okay. I'll just leave it. I'll just leave it at that. You don't know that it's you know you don't know that it's you're asking it to do the right thing. You don't know what it is you're verifying against is the correct thing. So. Verif program verification works for relatively small programs, tens of thousands of lines. Okay, maybe you know, 
these days, maybe 100,000. But they don't work on billions. And most systems are tens of millions of, of, of lines now. So there's a million and a million. I mean, you can use like, are you familiar with TLA plus? Do you know what I'm talking about when I say TLA plus? I can't hear. Do you, do you know what I mean when I say TLA plus? This is what they used to do verification of like uh, airplanes and stuff, right? You can break the thing into modules. Can design each module to have a certain behavior, and then you write to the spec. Let's let's talk offline. Okay, sure. This is th this is a geek conversation. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So I'm curious about the privatization of the cybersecurity solution industry that's been like rising recently because of the NSA's inability to capture all threats or deal with all threats effectively, and some larger companies that are more aware of these threats or have had exposure in the past might be more willing to contract these companies. I'm curious about whether that within like 20 or 30 years potentially leaves us in a future where mid-sized businesses or smaller businesses are much more likely to experience cyber threats just because they don't have the capabilities to contract companies to guard against them. Is that a concern in the cyber sphere? Absolutely. I mean, I think that, let me see if I get your question right. Okay. Your question is that, what about the little guy in the future? Are they going to be more vulnerable because they can't afford cybersecurity in the way that big guys can? Mm -hmm. Is that basically your question? Yes. You're absolutely right. And, and most government people who, who think about this stuff worry about exactly that problem, that the, the small modern, it's the moment problem, you know, grocery store kind of problem. How are they going to do a reasonable attack? And, you know, they don't have any. You know, they barely get their system up and running, and, and they can't afford that. I mean, I, I actually think there's a business opportunity here. Uh, if anybody wants to help me out with this, you know, I'll give you the idea and you, you, you can pursue it. But the idea is why can't a, a small business have the same security infrastructure that a uh, big company has? The answer is they can't afford it. Well, what if you put together you know, a whole number, a large number of small companies together and, and put them on the same uh, and give them the same kind of IT support. And, and is there something that you can do there? Uh, I think there's a business model in that, but I've never met anyone who is interested, who thinks they can make money on it. So. Thank you. I have a question up here. Yeah. Hello. Um, when I think of maybe the easiest vector for breaching cybersecurity, what comes to mind is open source projects and adding code. Maybe it's like the Linux kernel, for example. Um, does the US government maybe pay any attention to what code is going into major open source projects? Or is it just kind of the wild west? Um, the question is whether the US government pays attention to open source. It certainly is cognizant of, of, of open source. Does it monitor the code changes that get put into it? I don't think it does so systematically. I think it probably does it if it incorporates open source into its own critical applications. Um, but I wouldn't swear to that. So I don't, I, the, the answer is based on you know, everything else that I can give you is informed speculation. And speculation is informed by speculation. Well, I mean, they, they and, and sometimes they report them. I mean, so the, the claim here was that, that the US government will look for vulnerabilities in open source. I mean, they'll look for vulnerabilities in, you know, anywhere. Um, and sometimes they'll hoard them and sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll reveal them. And sometimes they may even fix them. The claim of the US government is that it has a bias towards revealing them. Okay, now you can believe that claim or not. But that, that is that is the public claim. Okay, so um, back there in back of you, there's somebody. No, you over there, right over there. Thank you for much for speaking with us today. It's been really interesting. Uh, I think my question has to do with uh, how do you deal with norm changes in terms of how we accept privacy, what we are willing to accept, and situations like truth on the internet, where Wikipedia and anarchist work 
action is now the arbiter of truth online. How does this sort of play into that? Do you see any places for norm change and informing the way that we manage security? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by security. Do you mean security against hacking or do you mean security against mods? Like the mind, the mind hacking. The mind hacking. So Wikipedia is, you say it, that, that it's the arbiter of, of, of truth. Um, I'd say it isn't because precisely for the reason that you, that, that you would question whether or not it is. And if, any, if anybody can change it, how do I know what, 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 what's in it? Um, on the other hand, I'm perfectly willing to go to Wikipedia to get a start on, you know, on an article that I'm writing. What I do is uh, I take the Wikipedia article and then first thing I do is I paste it into my document. Okay? And then knowing that it's, it's okay. And then I, I, I sort of go through it re and rewrite every line of it. Um, and then you know, sort of as, as a first way of getting my, of understanding the content what references could I get? Uh, you know, does the argument hold together? Huh. That's not a bad way to start to get myself smart about something. And then after all of that, I throw it away and I start over again. But it's not a bad way to start. But I don't, I, I, I don't know that it, I, I would call it the, uh, the arbiter. Um, and I think in the end, you're still, I, I, don't, I think that you're, this question of how do you know when something is true is a, is a very, very deep epistemological question, right? Um, and I think that we have not solved that, solved that problem. In fact, most of us learn stuff from trusted sources. Now, it, life is too short to actually verify that every source that I actually trust, and that I actually trust is right on everything. Well, I can only hope that I, I do all the appropriate consistency checks and, 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 and so on, but in the end, Am I vulnerable? Sure. Well, I don't have a good answer for you. I'm sorry. You asked me an unknown question, <laughs> an unanswered question. <laughs> um, over here. Oh, okay. Well, we have time, so, you know. Uh, thank you very much for this really, really great and important talk. I work on the history of risk in computing, so I found this really fascinating. And one of the things that I find particularly interesting is this question you have up here of what should we not computerize? And what I find striking about that is that this is a question which people have been asking about computers for pretty much as long as there have been computers. So many of these concerns that are coming up in this talk are things that people were talking about in the 50s, in the 60s, some of the specifics about misinformation and social media might be very current, but so many of these other concerns, they go back mm -hmm. quite a ways. You know, in yep. some ways we are living in the nightmare that we were warned about decades ago. So given that and some of the points you made about complacency and so forth, I'm wondering, and my apologies if this is a bit of a provocation, but like, what will it take you know, will it take something like the murder bots video, the point at which it's kind of already too late for people to change their ways? And on kind of a related note, do you see in your dealings with government and other groups, any pushes to move in a direction of fewer connections, of, fewer, of, of less complexity as a way of protecting against some of these threats? Thank you. Um, okay, so the last question that you asked was, is there any more put to simplify to have fewer connections? Um, I haven't seen it. I wish I had. Um, the first question that you said, said was, what will it take to wake people up? I think, I think that's what you said. Um, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I have been shouting about this for, 40 years in some sense. Uh, and and there, there's, there's a remarkable book that you might, and, and you probably know it, you know, Richard Weisenberg's book on computer power and human reason. For anyone 
interested in, in the subject. 1976, the professor of computer science uh, in Oxford uh, at MIT called Nick Joseph Weisenberg wrote a book called Computer Power and Human Reason. And it's basically a prediction of the dystopia that we're headed for. And most of what he wrote about has come true, is a fair statement. I mean, he, he was wrong about the AI technology and then he proposed it's been superseded by another AI technology. But other than that, um, you know, it, it, it's a chilling portrait of the world that we have, of the world that we have evolved into. Is that a fair statement about this? I work on it. Okay. Um, so, uh, what will it take? I'm, I'm, I'm personally not optimistic about that. On the other hand, well, there, there is one bit of optimism that I can, I can point out to you. Just that for all of history, every information technology, going back to the invention of writing, has been predicted to doom the human, to doom human cognition. Okay? When people talk about writing, they talk about, well, People will just, it'll just be an aid, an artificial aid to memory. People won't really remember stuff. They'll only appear to be smart. They'll only, they, they, um, uh, they'll pretend to be smart. They won't really be smart. Um, this is about writing, right? This is the very first information technology there was, committing stuff to writing. And most of you are too young for this, but Jeff, you and I will remember this. When you remember those days, when we would take a paper from a journal and then instead of reading it, we just copy it and put it into our files, right? I mean, we do that now with PDFs. We file a PDF, right? And it's now in a machine. And we think that we've learned, you know, there was a time when you actually had to read the damn thing. And you took notes on it. And we don't do that anymore now. Um, so, I mean, this, is, this, is, this has always been the case. Um, and maybe that's gonna be true here. Maybe this is all, you know, we'll all adapt. I kind of think we're not, but then again, I, people have told me that I'm not. So I'm a pessimist about this stuff. Okay, great. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. All right, great. So. Oh, uh, sorry. Oh, hey. sorry, sorry, you had the mic. Sorry. So we've heard a lot today and we see a lot in the news about cyber attacks on the US from North Korea, China and whatnot, American security and companies. America is a pretty big global power, um, yet we don't hear about American perpetrated cyber attacks. Are these happening you know, on other countries or on foreign companies like Tencent or Alibaba? Well, I think the answer is, is if the United States is an attack in other countries in cyberspace, somebody ought to be fired. I mean, I think the answer is pretty, if you were hanging around the US government for long enough, you would be the answer is pretty clear that we all are. We're doing a lot, but we just don't talk about it. So you hear I mean, offensive operations in cyberspace are among the most classified things that you could imagine. And we, we just don't talk about them publicly. Now, why we don't talk about them publicly is another, is a very interesting question. I don't understand that very well. Um, there's some taboo about talking about it. It goes beyond the classification issue. It's been a big deal for the United States to admit that it conducts offensive operations in cyberspace. That's a big, big, big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and even the Chinese people are not wiggling in uncertain about it. They don't quite know why. You know, why are we admitting this now? So we talk to anybody who's on this stuff. They're not actually talking about it. There are many plausible explanations. None of them I believe. Not by the United States. Not. China doesn't have the power to do that. The government is the one who does it. Just still giving everyone the opportunity to speak. Oh, yeah. So thank you very much for the talk, Dr. Lin. I have a question actually um, inspired by that which was just asked, which is why do you think that foreign states don't acknowledge US hacking against their networks while the United States tends to acknowledge hacking by foreigners against its networks. I have wondered about that. My only my my claim on it is that foreign foreign nations do not don't want to admit they're vulnerable to republics. That's my guess. But I don't know. I, I, I don't know what 
that's spec that's speculation on my part. And why do you think the United States is willing to acknowledge that source public? I think that the U.S. acknowledges that source public because it's the only way to get public support for investing in it and, 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 and so on. So I, I, that's the best answer I can give you. I, uh, I, I don't, other than the fact that the United States is, a, is an open, free and open democracy that believes in freedom of information and, and informing the citizens about what's going on. Thank you so much for the talk today. It's really interesting. Um, I wanted to uh, draw our attention back to something that you said earlier, which is um, cyber conflict doesn't look like war. There's a lot of these relentless small attacks that create the larger strategic effects. Um, and China recently released a statement at the Open and Networking Group about cyber war, saying that a cyber war can never be won and must never be fought, which really makes me think a lot about mutually assured destruction and, and nuclear, right? Um, and it also made me think about how much I don't know about uh, cyber war, because I still think about it in the realm of Stuxnet, right? So I was wondering, what, what do we know at the, the current moment about the magnitude of cyber war? And um, in what ways do you think it is appropriate to make a statement like that, that really kind of insinuates that it's, it's similar to nuclear? Thank you. I think that there's somebody tweaking uh, the United States um, in China. Uh, it is, of course, based on the, the formulation of nuclear war cannot be won and, and it should never be fought. And they're just substituting the word cyber for nuclear. Okay, so I think somebody there is trolling the United States on the threat. Uh, what's known about, I mean, I don't know what cyber war means in, 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 the con in, in context, right? Does cyber war mean the use of cyber tools to cause destructive effects during conflict? Well, you could, I mean, that's, you would say that that's sort of what nuclear weapons are about, too. Well, by that definition, well, is there, will there be cyber war? Sure. Or there'll be ordinary war in which there'll be missiles flying, bullets flying, and bombs dropping, and cyber weapons being used. Sure. If that's cyber war, sure, that, that, that would happen. So in that context, I don't believe the statement at all. Okay. Um, if you mean that cyber war would be something that's just going on in cyberspace, I don't even know what it means to, to win. So I, I, I think the statement on its face without more detail is a, is a meaningless statement. Um, I, I don't think I can parse that any, any, any more. But I need something more to argue with. I mean, I can't even say that the statement is wrong. So. Hi, I'm a student in a graduate school of education, and just to contextualize my my question, I want to preface that uh, at what point in your maybe high level engagements do does the question of ethics ever come comes up? You mentioned that you were a hacker in the beginning. I'm guessing there was some sort of a transformation um, that led you to where you are right now. Uh, so again, a uh, question of ethics and how that plays into this. So there, there's a there's a, a personal there's a personal element of that and a, and a sort of global element to it. Right? The personal element is is, is simple. Um, I stopped hacking because I I found that there were other more important and more interesting things to do. So when I was hacking, I was just looking around. I didn't see there was anything wrong with it. I enjoyed hacking into systems because I'm a system hacker. I, hacked, I also hacked bureaucracies just for the fun of it. Um, so, and I stopped because there's no, there's no percentage of it. So I didn't, I didn't get, you know, th there were more interesting things for me to do. The question of ethics, I think, is a very interesting one. I think people don't understand, really. There, there are people who say, I'm not one of them, there are people who say that the, that the legal regime, that law is supposed to capture the ethical issues of, uh, of cyber. Um, 
or you know, conflict. And I think we, we, I think we would all agree that ethics and law are not the same. Um, but there are lots of people who, who think that there are. Um, the United States has been quite clear in its view that international law applies to cyberspace. So are there other ethical considerations that, that go into it? I don't know the answer. Let me give you an example of, of, of one question that has been discussed outside the US government, but not seriously within. You know that when we have a cruise missile, we paint the stars and stripes on it. There's an insignia on the cruise missile that identifies it as an, a US missile. But if we put in malware into an implant into an adversary system, there's nothing in it that identifies it as American. Is that, are, are, are those analogous? It's an interesting question. I think the, the, the laws of war are silent on, on that kind of point. And there are people in the United States, sorry, analysts, in the United States who believe the answer is yes, you are able to do that. Of course, then the answer is, then couldn't the adversary just scan for anything that looks like an American file, you know, digital American file, and just filter it out? Well, maybe, but that, that would say you can't use these cyber weapons at all, but then nobody would use the cyber weapons. And then the people who, who are advocating this say, well, that's good. And the people who want the cyber weapons say, no, that's bad. So now you have to start thinking, if you want to say, oh, I continue to use them, you have to figure out a way of disguising them so they can't filter it out. Well, but then how will you ever know this from the United States? Well, then you say there's a public key that you have to set up a public key infrastructure or something like that that everybody can use to determine that this is really, you know, and it gets to be a real mess. Um, there's, there's a lot of, after that, it's produced a number of papers that I know on this subject, but nothing, you know, the US government has basically said it's illegal, the, the, the issue is illegal, they're not ethical. So we have about five more minutes for questions. Um, okay. Do we have other thoughts, anybody else? Oh, okay. Uh, okay, so um, my question, before, before, before asking, Question: I'd like to also give a thanks for you. Thanks for, for cyber uh, security and talking politically about uh, what happened, uh, especially in the states. I was also wondering about about the success of the national security that each country has for for uh, you know tackling the cyber threats. So I was just like questioning also like the can the uh, success of the national security police be used as an indicator for a country to be saved from the cyber threats? Um, as I contextualize this with the state actor principle, um, you know, like the success of the United States to maintain the security of cyber. But what about the developing countries that are difficult to implement the policies to have a strong national security, especially in the cyber uh, sector, because I come from one of the developing countries in the world, which is Indonesia, and we have like uh, such a very hard condition uh, of uh, us being as the home for 175 million internet users and a lot of unicorns in our country. So yeah, uh, that's the question for me. Thank you. I think that you're asking the question of how would, a, how does a developing nation strengthen its cybersecurity uh, when it is a developing nation? Where it doesn't have the resources of, the, of, a, of, a, of one of the, industrialized nations and how, how does it do it? You're right. Um, and it's a, 
in the end here, there is no, there, there, there's no good answer, okay? Because it does cost money. And I have, I have actually met with representatives of Indian Creek Fellowship who provide advice on how to build capacity and so on. And they always don't like what I have to say because they say you have to invest money and, and, and so on. There's no, there are no good ways of, of, of doing it on the cheap because you, you, have, to, you, you have to invest um, and, and you have to be willing to make the, the, the sacrifice to you know, whatever that is. Or you can develop your own indigenous expertise. But both are, 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 are costly in either time or, or, or money. And I think it's very, very hard. So like strengthening the ability of relations would be one of the best maintaining it. Do you think so? I'm sorry, strengthening the bilateral relations with other foreign countries. Yes, but mostly the, 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 the threats that Indonesia faces, for example, are by and large not national threats from another nation, but they're usually from criminal groups and so on. Um, although I can certainly imagine, you know, whoever Indonesia believes nationally is, a, is an adversary, they may have some incentives. And, and so that, that's a question of how you establish more peaceful relations. Nobody in the United States worries that Canada is going to attack the United States in cyberspace. So, and uh, one more question for you. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I used to work with the insurance com uh, companies on the insurance product for cybersecurity. And my question would be how much does insurance uh, industry play a role? A role in this uh, cybersecurity uh, industry, and is there any interesting development toward that? Because um, re um, as I know, it's still much of the patchwork between uh, cybersecurity firms and insurance um, company, and also law firm as well. So, right. The so the question is, how does the cybersecurity industry, how does the cyber insurance play in improving cybersecurity? What's its role? Insurance right, the, right the, the insurance industry, right. So the, the insurance industry, the, the idea behind, about behind cyber insurance is that they will provide you with insurance protection um, in the same way that they provide you with insurance against fire. Okay, so they'll, get, they'll insure you against a cyber incident same way they insure you against a fire, uh, against a fire or something like that. And yes, there are there are a variety of people doing that. Uh, the I think it's fair to say that the insurance, uh, cyber insurance industry, is at a very young stage. Uh, it is not very well developed, uh, and as a result of that, has not had much impact. Now the the concern or the, the hope is that as time goes on, it will become a more robust, more important thing for people to do um, and, and, and will therefore have more influence. So for example, if everybody has cyber insurance, then the cyber insurance industry can say, well, if you do X, Y, and Z, you get lower rates. And most people aren't doing X, Y, and Z, so they'll get better cybersecurity advice and get lower rates. So that's, that's the hope, okay, that's, but that has never really been realized uh, up until this point. Uh, there's a cynical view of cyber insurance that says that cyber insurance is the way that, that the insurance industry can avoid paying out in cyber. Um, because otherwise, the uh, cyber losses, uh, that they, you have to argue over whether or not a business interruption was due to cyber. And then, you know, th then it's up to the maximum limit of that. And that's a, that's a huge amount. What they do with cyber is they block that off and say, we'll only insure you um, at one tenth of or one one hundredth of what you would have been um, covered otherwise. So it's a way of avoiding payouts. That's the that's the that's the cynical view of cyber insurance. So I, I think it has a long way to go before it's before it's significantly influential. All right. Well, with that being okay. said, thank okay, you. that's it, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you for, for an interesting discussion. Thanks very much.